Hi everybody, welcome to today's video. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the registers and the components of the CPU. Um, our focus today is going to be on those registers and what I hope you get at, by the end of this video is a, a basic understanding of how the registers work, how they're broken down, um, and, and how we can use them in a program. Uh, it's important to get that high level understanding because when we start working with assembly, we start writing our programs, we're going to be working with these registers as the primary means in which we're moving data into and out of our program. And, and all CPUs do. Uh, when we program at higher level, though, uh, we don't work with these operations directly. And so that's really the number one takeaway today. Um, probably the secondary thing that is, is important is start to get an understanding about memory addresses and, and the, the overall address space, the memory layout of a program as it starts to run. Um, we'll talk about that with virtual addressing or virtual memory here as we get towards the end of today's content. And it's very important to understand that. That's not going to be an exhaustive uh, look into that, right? I just want to start to introduce some of these concepts. Um, the next video or two will probably be kind of like this. I mean, pretty much this entire week we're going to be uh, kind of build, building in some of that background. Uh, so then that following week when we move into lab two, we can start actually doing some of the more hands-on work, you know, actually start writing some assembly programs. So uh, to get started, We'll take a look at uh, computer organization because it all starts with memory. It all starts with the bit. And the bit, as uh, we can typically think of it or generally define it, has a one or a zero. I'm going to change my color here. Right, so that's really kind of the, the basic unit of measure or organization that we have uh, is that one or zero. It's binary. Everything is binary. Programs, when they're saved on disk, when they're executed and loaded into memory, it's just a series of ones and zeros. And what the computer do, does then is organizes those into different you know, units of measure, different basic units. We have the byte, the kilobyte, the megabyte, the gigabyte, and so forth. And then through that and, and the computer's ability to read that information, determine you know, how to look at those ones and zeros to interpret it as data, as code, as something to execute as an address, um, that's how we get the programs to execute. So typically, when it comes to moving, moving data uh, you know, around in the system, from the CPU to the registers and into memory, uh, the basic unit is the byte. Right? So a byte here is going to be defined as 8 bits. Um, and uh, from there, that is typically the minimum, minimum amount of data that we can move. You may see uh, as you get further on in your career, maybe you take the reverse engineering course or uh, other things like that, that different systems may actually have a different basic unit um, of the amount of memory that they move. Maybe it's two bytes, maybe it's four bytes, uh, whatever. But you know, for our purposes here, uh, we're talking about that being the basic unit. Now, we can start to think about then, well, what does that mean? How can you take eight bits, you know, eight, one, or zeros, just laid out in a sequence and turn that into anything useful, anything practical. How does the, the program, the computer, actually um, execute things based off of that? Well, when we start to have organization, we have things like the ASCII character sets. Uh, the ASCII character set takes up one byte, so one byte, eight bits, and we can represent data that way. We can say that this value then represents uppercase A or lowercase A um, or any of the other characters that we typically associate with uh, kind of the Western world. Uh, you look at your keyboard. You know, most of those characters, I think, if not all of them, uh, can be represented using the ASCII character set. Um, other ways, then, we run into you know languages where we need or, or, or situations and where we need a greater character set in order to display all those symbols, all those characters. Um, and so we have other things like Unicode um, that allows us then, because it uses you know, a greater amount of memory, um, it can it can um, it can show more characters. Uh, as far as assembly goes, uh, we're going to probably run into these units of measure. They talk about them in the book, so hopefully you, you've read through that chapter, that material, and you've got a basic understanding here. Um, but we'll have things like the word, the double word, the quad word, and they go beyond that. You know, we're, we're primarily going to focus on the 32-bit world here in the course, x86. Uh, we're not looking at 64-bit. And so with that, because 8 bytes, 8 bytes is the total number of, you know, that's the maximum number of bits that we're going to be able to fit in any of these registers that we're talking about, right? Because if we look at one byte, hopefully this comes through, one byte equals 8 bits, right? And we have two bytes is equal to 16 bits. Uh, sorry, take that back. And four bytes is equal to 32 bits. Right, so we don't typically deal with the quad word because that would actually be 64 bits. And on a 32-bit machine, we don't have 64 bits of, of space directly available. Um, and so we typically will deal with word and double word. 
those are, are almost like a like a, you can almost think of them like a variable type like saying int uh, and that we're just simply defining here the number of bits that are available two bytes four bytes a byte being one byte all right so how does this work how does the actual cpu take the that, that binary and turn it into something that it can execute so uh, it all starts with the, uh, the, the CPU fetching. So it looks at that data on disk, uh, it fetches it, it gets it out of the register, it gets it out of that primary memory, it decodes it. And so we're going to talk about mnemonics here in, the, in a couple of lectures. Um, mnemonics are what we'll use primarily in assembly in order to give us that, that one step above machine code to say, okay, this, this actually we're going to say move or jump or call, and that actually represents a series of ones and zeros. Um, so it has to decode that though. It has to take that, um, that that binary and figure out what does this instruction actually mean? Are we moving? Are we jumping? Are we calling? What are we actually doing? Um, once it's done that, then we execute, right? The CPU actually executes that instruction. It performs that operation or whatever that instruction told it to do. Uh, stores the results, if any, and then it just repeats the process. Fetch the next code, decode it, execute, store result. And so you can see um, that this just becomes a never-ending loop, a never-ending process of the CPU fetching those instructions for those programs that are running, uh, decoding it, executing it, and then storing the result. All right, so as far as some more information about the organization of the computer, um, we have, you know, typically when you think about memory, uh, you think about the primary memory, your RAM, uh, and you have 16 gigs or 8 gigs or something. Um, that's kind of your primary. That's volatile. When you shut your system down, whatever was stored in your RAM essentially goes away, and you boot your machine back up, and then it starts using that in real time. Um, we have, you know, our primary storage. I'm sorry, not primary, but our secondary, you know, our persistent storage. We have something like a hard drive, whether that's a solid state or a spinning disk. And those are the things that we expect to write information to or data to and have it stay there. We, we shut our machines down, we start them back up, and that data is still on that disk. It's been written there. It's, it's more permanent. Um, at the CPU level, though, we have a series of registers. And as I said at the beginning of this lecture here, those really are going to be what we're going to focus on. Um, throughout the next couple of lectures. Uh, the registers are little chunks of memory that are available while the CPU is executing those instructions to store data, to, to put the operands, to store results uh, as it's executing and it's figuring out what instruction to execute next. Right, so we're going to take a look at those here over the next few slides. Um, we also have a register for flags and what flags give us through a one and a zero. Either something happened or it didn't. Um, what these flags allow us to C are when certain things happen, when certain events happen, when an instruction is executed. You know, was there uh, a carry? Was there an overflow? And we'll take a look at those here in a little bit. Um, we have memory addresses, and memory addresses begin become very important to understand, uh, not just for the course, but moving on. As I mentioned earlier, if you if you get more interest in, uh, you know, for example, for probably more practical purposes here at Dakota State, you have taken the the reverse engineering course, the CSC 444. Um, understanding how the the instructions, how this data is written into memory, and how is it being accessed? Uh, you know, how does the ex execution flow, the flow of a program, go based off of how it's laid out in memory? And so these memory addresses become pretty important. Hopefully, you had some exposure to that throughout 150 or 250. Again, at Dakota State, typically students are introduced to the concept of a pointer. Uh, which then brings on a, a variety of other topics there to include things like dynamic memory allocation with malloc. Um, but hopefully you got an, a little bit of an understanding there uh, in your discussions and, and hopefully your exercises using pointers. You know, pointers point to an address. They point to a place in memory so that you can access things. You can access data or other pointers. Um, we also have input-output functions. And so you will see a lot of times uh, these are, are functions that are going to be integral in a program in order to write data, write it to a disk, write it to a thumb drive, write it to the screen, the display, monitors, our form of I.O. Uh, we have input, and we deal with input just about every time when we touch a device. You know, we have the keyboard, we have the touch interface on something that's mobile, all sorts of ways in that we have the ability to take that data and make it become an input in that program uh, and have that input being processed on. Um, as I mentioned, there's a variety of I.O. devices, you know, not just the things we normally think about, USB and hard drives. Uh, we have sound cards, we have monitors, we have a keyboard, wireless and Ethernet as well, right? There are, there are ways of taking data from external and bringing it to the internal. 
Right. Uh, the book goes through, I think, in, in enough detail at this level, uh, a little bit of the history of the, the families of the x86. I just wanted to go through here. We're not going to, we don't need to cover everything on the slide. Um, but really what I wanted to point out here was just why, you know, why do we talk about it as x86? Uh, or what does x86 actually mean? Um, you know, typically, and and if you've been on you know working with computers over the last few years, you've you've probably been uh, aware of that that general transition that we've had between uh, 32-bit and 64-bit machines, and that might have been the only way that you've you've been aware of it. You know we have x86 and x64, and well it's it's relatively obvious that x64 means 64-bit. Where did 86 come from? Well, it, it's kind of a historical thing, and that we have these these you know these models, these series of uh, computers that were developed. You know, several years ago now, decades ago now, um, 8088 and the 8086, as well as the 8286. Um, and what these systems had, these series of computers had, were these 16-bit registers. And so 16-bit, those registers, you can see they're laid out here. These are what those registers were called. AX, BX, CX, DX, SIDI, BP, SP, CSDS, SS, ES, and IP. And it's, it's important, we're going to cover, we're going to use most of these registers throughout the course. We're not going to use all of them. But we're gonna we're gonna use most of them. Um, what happened then when the 8386 was introduced uh, was that it added a 32-bit mode, or took these registers and instead of being 16 bits, uh, they made them 32 bits. This is what gave us, and this is why I guess for most consumers why we care about this is because this we were limited by memory. We had fewer addresses. That means we had fewer. Um, you know, since we had fewer addresses, we were limited the amount of memory that we could use in that system. Um, when we doubled that and we made the 32-bit mode, then what that did was it took all the registers that we see here and essentially added an E in front of them. That, that means extended. So we extended EAX, extended EBX, and so all of these same registers, AXBX, CXDX, just have an E in front of them. So when you see the registers being referred to in the 32-bit machine, uh, you typically see E in front of those. Um, the 46 came along that was faster. We have different instruction sets that have been introduced over the years. Uh, MMX was one that was uh, instruction set, you know, specific mnemonics that were to help or to improve uh, kind of that multimedia stuff. Um, and this was, again, this was several years ago. Um, and so what you get then is you can see that with all these models, we have 86 behind them. And so that's where, uh, except for that little guy there. Uh, that's where it just generally became the x86 family because because the 16-bit and the 32-bit we were, we were pretty much talking about the same instruction set so it was just as easy to lump them into the same now 64-bit's a little bit different because we have again we've taken this uh, you know the 32-bit space we've made it 64-bits we've changed the registers and add some registers uh, and so a little bit different uh, most of our computers now are 64-bit machines most of our laptops uh, desktops and those things. So um, we'll probably talk about 64-bit towards the end of the course, just so you have an understanding. The the primary reason we stay with 32-bit uh, at this point in time, well, one, it's because that's what our book covers. Uh, I think it's a good book. It's and uh, and it's a 32-bit book, basically. Basically, um, the other thing is that you know there's still a lot of um, you know you, you don't find a lot of practical. You know, most developers aren't writing assembly. You know, now in the security field, you probably will be. Um, you'll be dealing with malware. You'll be dealing with exploitation and writing shell code and things. Um, and so a lot of your expo exploitation can still be done in 32-bit. A lot of malware is still in 32-bit. Um, and and so one of the things that Windows has always done, and then and you can argue that this has been a good thing and a bad thing, is it's maintained compatibility. That is that in a 64-bit machine, we can have 32-bit code execute. Now, that doesn't go the other way, so we can't have 64-bit um, execute on a 32-bit machine. Um, but the old stuff, and this is what Microsoft wanted out of it, was that the old stuff would be able to move forward with the new stuff. That backwards compatibility has been very important to them. And so, you know, if we think about this, for for example, as a malware author, because we deal with still a ton of malware, um, you know, if I'm going to write, sit down and write a program that's malicious, you know, I'll probably going to choose 32-bit because I know it's going to work on all 32-bit machines. In addition, it's going to work on all 64-bit machines. And uh, if I went the other way around and I said I'm going to write 64-bit malware, I'm going to lose all those 32-bit you know machines that are out there uh, in the market. And so um, I'm not. That's not to say that there isn't 64-bit malware. There is. There's plenty of it. Um, and that's shifting as as people have more and more 64-bit machines, 64-bit processors. Uh, but it's kind of one of those historical context things, or, or there's the, the reasons why 32-bit is still pretty dominant. All right, so what is a register? Uh, it's a very high-speed piece of memory. And you have, with your CPU, we talked about that instruction cycle. And that cycle happens 
based off of the frequency of the clock, the system clock. And so you say something is 2.6 gigahertz, it's doing 2.6 billion operations per second. What these registers are important is because they can, we can transfer, the CPU can transfer and access those registers, moving data in and out of them at that same clock speed, that 2.6 billion operations per second. And so they can keep up with the, the, you know, the, the tempo at which the CPU is operating. When we move to primary memory, even RAM, we're orders of magnitude slower. Act, the CPU having to access things out of RAM is still a lot slower than these registers. And so we need these registers in order for our, our computers to essentially work the way they do. Um, we go even one step further and say now we have to access something off a disk. Um, even with a solid state, this is again much slower than RAM, which is much slower than these registers. Uh, the problem with the registers is that they're very little memory. 32 bits, you know, 16 bit was, was less than 32, 32 is less than 64. Um, and so there's not there is not, uh, you know, we're limited to what we can actually do due to that space. Um, something that is important to understand, though, is that these registers, and we'll talk about these general purpose registers, right? So when we say general purpose, what I'm talking about then is EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX, general purpose. They're just generally used to move data into and out of. And, and again, you'll see as we go through a lot more of the, the labs and the code samples, you'll see that how we use those and, and, and I get I think get a better understanding of what general purpose actually means. Um, as far as these general purpose registers then, um, you can break them down like this. Right. And so we have, uh, at times we have the full, if we register, if we reference EAX, we have the full 32 bits of that register. Um, if we say AX, right, and what did, what did we learn on the last couple slides? AX, it was the original 16 bit register. And so AX can reference the lower 16 bits of EAX. And then from there, we can take AX and we can break that down even further and say AL and AH in which case AL is the lower 8 bits of AX and AH is the higher 8 bits of AX, right? One thing that you'll notice here is that there's no way to directly reference the upper 16 bits of EAX, right? We got the lower 16 and of that lower 16 we have the lower and upper uh, 8 bits of that register or the full 32 bits, right? Now this is important because what will happen in a program is you'll only use the portion of the register that you actually need. Right? If I say that uh, I have, right, we just we, did, we talked about 32 bits is equal to four bytes, and we know that a char, an ASCII char anyway, is only one byte. Well, if, if that's the case, then we might not need, or we certainly don't need, a full 32-bit register for um, for that char. And so we can only, we only need eight bits. So if we wanted to, in order to be more efficient, uh, we could reference AL or AH, right? And so you'll see that with code. Not only can you do it as you're writing assembly, you can reference a portion of a register and only the portion that you need, um, but you'll also see uh, that if you if you get to the point where you're looking at maybe reverse engineering, where you're looking at um, the, the process of taking your source code and compiling it, compilers do things to your code, optimizations that you maybe don't intend. Um, and you can look at that disassembled code then after it's been you know run through a compiler, uh, and you'll see that compilers will do things like this. It'll say, oh, I'm only gonna use the lower half of this register because it's a byte. I only need eight bits. I don't need to reference all of EAX. All right, so here is a breakdown. If we think about this in um, a little bit more of a graphical sense, um, you know, I'm gonna say that this here is, let's just say it's, it's any of our general purpose registers, right? EAX, so I'll pick on EAX, right? So this whole space here is our 32-bit register, right? So in order to access this, because this is now uh, 16 bits here, the only way we can access that is through using EAX. We have to use the entire register. Um, below, right, we can break this down. And so, change the color here to, let's go to red. Uh, we can reference this overall portion, right? And this becomes AX, right? That gives us 16 bits. All right, so AX, 16 bits. Um, from there, we can break down AX even further. All right, so we have AL and AH, and each one of these is eight bits a piece. 
right? And so we have to think about that. We can think about that this register kind of in this context. Um, we lay this out though. Remember, these are bits. These are ones and zeros. So we'd have at our disposal here. Right, those numbers of ones and zeros, that many ones and zeros. And when you're working at this lower level, you do need to think in terms of ones and zeros, bits and bytes and other of these you know, relatively um, small units of measure. 32 bits, right? That's the maximum on a 32-bit system that we can move into. Right, so this is a way, another way of looking at that register. EAX gives us the whole register, all 32 bits. AX gives us the lower 16 bits, right? So. And then AL and AH gives us the upper and lower eight bits of AX. Can only do that with the general purpose. And we'll take a look here. There's a diagram in the next slide or so. Uh, there's a couple of other registers that can be broken down a little bit further based off of whether they're you know 16 bit or 32 bit. We'll take a look at those here in just a moment. All right, so here's a chart that shows that. So we have our 16-bit here and our 32-bit here. And just like we got done talking about, we have all the general purpose registers here. And you can see this shows you. It's a little hard to see here, maybe on the video. So I'd encourage you to download the slide. Um, but you can see that you have AX, BX, CX, and DX. And those can be broken down, just like we talked about, the upper and the lower, AH and AL. Um, that same register space is available on EAX, so on the extended, the 32-bit mode. Um, and then we also have that upper 16 bits, which is not directly accessible. Uh, we have some of these other pointers, SPB, PSIDI, uh, ESP, EBP, ESI, EDI, and those uh, in a similar fashion, because these are the extended ones, we have the ability to, if we wanted to, instead of referencing ESP, which would be a 32-bit, we can just use SP, which would be a 16-bit. Although for this course, you'll see very little of that. We probably won't be doing much with these directly. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ESP, EVP when we get into the stack. We'll mainly be working with our general purpose registers. Uh, and then we have these other registers here, flags and e-flags, and, and again, we'll talk about those here uh, a little bit later in this lecture. All right, this over here is just another way of looking at that same information. So what do we use the registers for? Well, uh, general purpose is the those four general purpose registers, even though they're general purpose, and we can use those for anything. Um, what you'll see with some of them is they have they, they tend to have a particular purpose, right? So if we have we have EAX and ECX, um, EAX can be used as an accumulator or for data. And so um, maybe inside of a loop, we have, you know, think of a typical for loop, uh, we want to accumulate data. And so we can store that data in EAX. EAX is also typically where when a function returns, the value that it returns is left into EAX, right? So if your function is to provide the sum of something, then when it returns, it leaves that sum inside of EAX. And we'll go through some examples here later on in the course to help further explore that. Uh, ECX is typically used for counters. So looking at loops, for loops and while loops. Um, ESP is our extended stack pointer, and we'll spend quite a bit of time here when we get into the stack. Uh, I think that's going to come about mid-course. We'll spend quite a bit more time talking about the stack pointer and what that's actually used for, as well as the frame pointer, the base pointer. So uh, ESP and EBP are, are pretty closely related. Um, ESI, EDI, source and destination, you'll see those registers used for transferring data, uh, moving a string maybe from one location to another uh, string copy or something. Um, so here's the source, here's the destination. We're, we're copying an array, we're copying data, we're transferring data around. Um, we'll also see that in certain situations, we can actually use multiple registers at the same time. And so you may see the syntax. You, you should have read about it by now, uh, looking at the multiply, divide, and uh, in the text, in that EDX and EAX, if we combine those two registers, then that gives us 64 bits. And the reason why is even on a 32-bit machine, if we multiply two 32-bit values, you may get up to a 64-bit number. And so we have to have a way that even with in the 32-bit environment that we can represent 64 bits of data. Uh, and so you'll see that usage when we, we talk about multiplying and dividing. Okay, IP, EIP, very, another very important register, uh, because what this does is this really, that's the basic purpose here is to control execution, 
So it points to the current instruction to be executed. We put that value, that address, into that pointer, into that register, so that it knows what's next to be executed. Um, we cannot modify this directly, although there are instructions, mnemonics, operations that we can call that will indirectly modify that. So we do things like jump or call um, that will then transfer execution because what it does is it essentially loads that, that address where it needs to go into EIP so that EIP will then load that instruction out of memory. Um, we'll talk about this more as we get into the flow of our assembly programs, especially when we start talking about um, some of those, those basic constructs like if statements and loops and, and functions and calling functions. Um, so uh, it's a very important for that. In a security context, uh, it used to also be very important for exploitation. And that is that if you could find a way to exploit an application, typically through an overflow, buffer, or stack overflow, um, and you could gain control of EIP because EIP points to where the, the, the control of the execution of the program goes next. If you can control that address, then you can get it to go and do whatever you want it, essentially. You could you could maybe uh, inject or, or deliver some shell code and then have the instruction pointer jump to that shell code and execute basically execute your code, you know, arbitrary code execution. Um, that's changed a lot with uh, ASLR and DEP and some of these mechanisms that we have in order to mitigate these things. Um, and, and you'll probably, we won't do a whole lot with that this semester, at least I'm not certain we will anyway, maybe towards the end of the course, uh, but definitely if you're interested in it, I would encourage you to, to you know, consider the reverse engineering course because we'll do more stuff with that in that course. All right, as far as the instruction pointer, so if we take a look at, and let's just think about this again, very big picture um, that we have, uh, you know, these statements here. This is our, our program and these are all the instructions that we want to execute. Uh, we have IP, EIP, and right now it's pointing to this address and it knows that once that's executed, that if nothing changes that, we don't jump, we don't call, uh, it just goes in and fetches the next instruction. And so EIP, where it's pointing, just keeps changing as we execute these instructions. Now let's say that we get down to an instruction down here, and that instruction's a jump. So now we change, we say jump, and then we say a new address. And maybe in this case, this was part of a loop. So that jump tells uh, EIP to go back up to here. Right? And now, because it executes that statement and it does the jump, it moves to this address, uh, and now it starts to execute instructions. It just continues to move down the line again. Um, this could be conditional, right? Just like an if, you know, if, you know, if or for or a while, you know, while this is true, continue to jump back up here. When this is no longer true, then execution uh, can continue on in the program. Right? Each one of these instructions though, is going to come in a memory address. And so this, this pointer, this register, is determining then what address to go to load that instruction in order to continue this execution. All right, flags register. You saw that uh, there was a, you know, the original 16-bit and the 32-bit now. Um, flags is a register with ones and zeros, just like all the other registers. What happens though is that certain portions of that register um, we look for whether it's a one or a zero, whether it's set or not set in order to determine or get information out of that flags register. The kind of information that it contains is things like carry. You know, was there a carry? Did we have an operation that results in a carry? Uh, was there an overflow? Um, is the sign flag set? Talk about signage, right? W whether something is, is signed or unsigned, whether it's it simply is allowed to be negative or positive. I talked a little bit about that with two's complement. Um, and looking at that, if it does the result of an operation result in a negative number. Uh, if it does, then the sign flag is set. So we'd look in that register uh, for the sign flag and we'd know that the result was negative. Um, zero flag does the result of subtracting two things uh, the result of the oper operate, operation excuse me, uh, result in zero. And if so, set the zero flag. Um, we'll spend a lot of time here initially you know, when we look at the zero, when we, when we deal with the flags register, probably the primary one really throughout the course will be the zero flag. We'll, we'll spend the most time um, in the commands, the, the instructions that we write or use in our programs. We'll check that zero flag in order to do some basic, you know, some of our basic uh, control execution of our programs. All right, segment registers, we probably won't do a whole lot with those. Um, just wanted to just touch on them just to make sure you knew that they, at least what they were kind of that big picture again. Um, they're segments that store information about where elements are located. So we have the code segment, 
uh, typically read only. That's typically the code of our program. That's the instructions that should be uh, fetched in order to execute and, and run our program. Typically that's read only because that is our program. We don't want to modify that. Uh, we have the data segment and that's typically going to be read and write because it's a segment that we have our variables. And so variables, the value of variable changes throughout the execution of a program. So we're going to need to be able to read and write there. Um, it's important to keep these segmented because uh, we can't, we don't want these two to intermix because we don't want to allow the code of the program to change. Data we do. And so there's security uh, as well as some other issues as far as why we put these things into different segments. Uh, we have the stack segment, so the area that's responsible for the stack. And we'll get more into the stack here later on in the semester. It's one of those key things to understand throughout the course is the stack. Um, and then some extra segments, and, and those are uh, not as important really at this point in time. Okay, um, this is just something I wanted to touch on, and that's uh, the virtual memory, and, and how is an application laid out in memory. And so just talking about this big picture to hope, help you hopefully get a better understanding as to what happens when a program runs. We talk about all these addresses, and what does that actually mean? Um, well, think about a program in kind of two ways. We have the actual uh, binary, the executable that's on a disk somewhere, and then we have what happens when it's actually executed. Right, so you have that program sitting on your desktop and you double click it and then it executes and it runs. And so what happens between that? Well, what happens is that we have, uh, at least with most general purpose operating system like Windows, um, we have this, this thing called virtual memory. And what virtual memory gives us is a, a kind of a layer of abstraction from the actual physical memory. So we have this virtual memory that maps to physical memory, but that mapping is, is all handled by the operating system. So what the program gets, what it runs then, is one contiguous block of memory, a bunch of addresses that are all sequential, that are all in series, um, that it can use then for its address space. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is important. Think about uh, arrays in 115, 250. You know, what do you get in C when you declare an array? Uh, well, you get a, a series of sequential addresses in order to store data in. That's how you can do things. You can access those values by saying array, which is square bracket, and then the index, 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, because they're laid out in a continuous block of address spaces. Um, so this is important, and this is important for, for a variety of reasons. Um, the physical then, right? We don't, we don't have to worry about that. We certainly don't have to worry about it as the programmer um, because the operating system is handling that for us. Uh, because that was painful, and that used to be how systems, you know, operating systems ran, is that programs would need a contiguous block of physical space. That became very limiting, very challenging, because you wouldn't always have every the space available for that process or that program, right? And so the virtual memory allows us to do that. Um, we have some benefits, as I just talked about. Memory isolation is another one, and in theory, anyway, um, this provides more security, and that when a program runs, it should only have access to the memory space that's assigned to it, the virtual memory that's assigned to it, and that it can't jump to other processes or other places in memory without causing an error. Um, you've probably ran across that when you got a segmentation fault in C. You, you tried to access a place in memory that you did not have permission to, and that's where you get that segmentation fault. Um, we'll talk a little bit about paging, uh, because this is an important uh, concept. Again, not quite so much to get through the course, but uh, I do think it's important to understand just in general, um, and that we, we have these, this paging structure that provides us for kind of some better performance and some different ways in which the memory is actually managed. Um, that also gives us the ability to have more memory than we physically have available. So if you've ever thought of or seen the virtual memory settings inside of Windows, um, it is, yes, potentially using your hard drive, um, but it's doing it in ways that maybe you didn't quite realize if you've never looked into this. Um, applications don't have to manage the shared memory space. Right, we talked about that. Applications don't do it. The operating system does it um, and uh, can prevent relative addressing. And I don't know if we'll get too far into that for this course here. So here's a way to look at uh, the, the virtual address space of a program. Right, so when a program runs, it needs addresses. It needs memory. And so you can see that we start with uh, these lower addresses, and then we work our way up to these higher addresses, and then certain things are laid out in that address space for our program. Certain addresses are available for that program to use while it's running. Um, some of them we don't have anything to do with. The, the way that the operating system loads that executable and runs it takes care of that here. Text and data, some of those segments that we talked about. Um, some of them we, we do in a way. We have the stack. We talk, we'll talk about the stack in great detail here. We'll, we'll touch on the heap as well. And so some of these addresses, some of the space is available to us to use dynamically as our program is running, right? This is contiguous. 
zero 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 whatever through this address here. And so when we talk about addresses, this is how we're looking at these addresses. 0x, meaning that this is a hexadecimal value. Um, and you can see here that this is now our 32-bit number. And so we have um, a range of addresses contiguously available to this program to run. What happens physically though? Well, we have address space, uh, but sections, and you can see here through this, this key that some of these the blue ones belonging to this process, the, the pinkish ones belonging to something else, they might be laid out differently. They might be segmented or fragmented on that in that actual RAM. Um, and so, you know, we can take advantage of that uh, as far as the program runs, but we don't have to worry about it. The operating system manages this layout. Uh, you can think of it kind of like uh, your hard drive and that your hard drive can write it performs better, at least the solid, the, the spinning state, uh, excuse me, the spinning disk did. Um, and they tend to operate better when you can write, you know, larger chunks of data all in the same place on the hard drive. Uh, but when, as the as you read and write a lot to a disk, especially a spinning disk, uh, that gets fragmented. And as that gets fragmented, what happens then is that the, you know, something is being, let's say, a file is being written across different sections and sectors on that drive. And so that when you go to read it, when the operating system goes to read it, it has to move that read write head into more places to actually get all that data. It becomes fragmented. And then you can go through and you can defragment it. And that usually improves your performance for a while. Right. So those are some of the big benefits here. And this is just kind of conceptually how this memory and these addresses are laid out. Um, this talks a lot of what we've already covered here. So the slide, I guess, is a little bit redundant. Um, Again, it's just, a, I think, a different way of looking at what we just talked about. Uh, and then here's our virtual address space. This is the virtual memory for our program. Um, these sections then map to these places in physical memory, but the physical memory might be broken up. It might even consist of some of it being written on disk. Uh, disk doesn't have to be contiguous. The mapper, the memory mapper, uh, maintains or, or manages that relation, You know, taking those virtual address space and mapping it to the physical. Right. When a process needs to access memory, then it consults a page table, and that page table tells it f which physical addresses to use. Right. So that page table is what you know what, is what part of what helps provide that bridge, um, because we don't want to map each byte. That would be terribly inefficient. Uh, what what has been developed then is the concept of pages, and what pages allow us to do then uh, is to access kind of smaller blocks of memory or these addresses uh, at a time. Um, Let's see. When uh, memory is loaded, uh, and we can then, um, because there's a, there's a certain file format, and we're not going to talk about it in the course, but just if you're interested, I think it's definitely, if you, if you find this kind of material interesting anyway, um, you'll want to spend some time doing some research. It's the PE format, the, P, the portable executable format. Um, and what happens then, that's your typical format that, that, uh, that binary is in uh, when it executes on a Windows machine. Um, what happens then is those certain sections, those segments that we talked about, um, they need to be mapped into memory. And what we do then when we load those into memory is we can put those sections in pages. And those pages will just be a certain size, maybe four kilobytes. Um, those pages then have permissions that are set. And so if a section needs to be read only, um, then that page will be set to be read only. And so that way that address space we know that as the CPU is fetching information out of there, um, it can read it, but it can't modify it. And so these pages then can have certain access rights being set, the read, the write, and the execute. Um, you know, again, this is probably a little bit more important for in, in a security context, but nonetheless, it's important information. Um, paging then is a, is a management scheme. And what it allows us to do, kind of the primary purpose of it, is it allows for retrieval of data from secondary storage, something like a hard drive, for use in primary storage, our RAM. Um, it allows swapping. And so we mentioned earlier that if we run out of physical RAM, what can happen then is you can start seeing um, page ins and page outs. Uh, that is that we need to take some page, some chunk of memory, some address space that's in physical RAM, uh, and move it into a secondary storage device like a hard drive in order to allow something else to be moved into primary storage. You know, some other piece of, uh, some other piece of the program. Um, because we want this to be efficient, pages then are organized in same size blocks, right? We talk about it in, you know, like a four kilobyte block. Um, so we move these things in blocks at a time. 
Um, so what this ultimately gives us then is contiguous virtual address space, but non-contiguous physical address space, which is really kind of one of those key concepts here that we're going through virtual memory in general. Um, the page fault, page fault is simply just like I said, uh, you the program needs to access part of its code. It's not loaded in a primary memory, so it has to load it up. Um, if it has to do that uh, and pull it from disk, then it's a fault because what happens uh, is that it, it has to it slows the process down a little bit. It's expensive because the the CPU has to fetch that data from the hard drive instead of from RAM or from you know that that primary storage, which is a lot faster. All right, page fault and paging uh, is also a type of an interrupt, right? And so this slide really just kind of covers or, or recaps that of which we just got been talking about. Uh, the last thing are interrupts. We'll deal a little bit with interrupts here as again as we get towards the end of the course. We'll talk about system calls. Um, interrupts interrupt the flow of the program. Uh, there are a variety of, of categories: hardware, software errors. Hardware interrupts, for example, a keyboard. And what, that's, what that interrupt does is it tells the CPU to stop what it's currently executing on uh, and handle the input coming in from the keyboard. Because we're running you know, 2.6 billion or whatever your, your speed of your CPU is, um, you know, that many number of, of instructions, executing that number of instructions per second, uh, it can handle quite a bit of interrupts and seem to, to you and me as the end user here that it isn't interrupting, that everything is running and it's actually running everything at the same time. Um, we have a timer. Right. Usually programs are executing, they're only given so many instructions before an interrupt occurs and it moves on to another process. It just does it so rapidly that it looks seamless to us. Um, and of course that was more of an issue in the single CPU, the single core days. And now we have double, you know, quad core and, and uh, double core machines, dual core machines, uh, in which case multiple things are allowed, multiple instructions are allowed to be uh, executed at the same time. Um, reading and writing to the disk, accessing the network all things that are hardware interrupts. An interrupt occurs to tell the CPU, you know, hey, some traffic's coming in on the network, you need to stop executing what you're doing now and handle that, that traffic coming in. Um, we have software interrupts. Uh, you can have a timer in hardware and in software. Um, you can have things like illegal memory access, and you can also have errors, uh, also called traps. You, know, you try to divide by zero. Um, you try to perform or execute an illegal instruction. You try to access a legal memory, memory that you don't have, an address that you don't have access to, uh, as we mentioned, the seg fault. All right, so uh, that's it. Again, the, the hopefully the key takeaway here was um, just to start to get an understanding of address and address spacing, as well as, and in the primary was the register and how the registers are broken down. So general purpose, uh, we'll talk about the stack pointers here when we get to the stack. 32 bits, we can break them down into AX, AL, and AH. And as you change registers, we just change what portion. So EAX, AX, you know, EBX, VX, ECX, uh, CX and CH and CL, right? So just depending on the register that we're accessing. Um, that's it. Uh, if you need me to, you know, if there's anything that didn't quite make sense, uh, this is the first time I've really included the virtual memory portion in, in this course. So um, if that wasn't enough to help, let me know. And I can certainly generate some more content so we can go over that in a little more detail um, and uh, go from there. So uh, with that, I'll stop the video and I'll see you guys in the next video, in the next lecture. Thanks.